Our guest today is a very special person. Our guest is one Sig Enns. And I'd like to start by saying that he served as a member of parliament for Portage Nipua between the tumultuous years of 1962 to 68. He's already celebrated his 91st birthday. So our guest has lived for almost a century. Congratulations to you. Oh, thank you. Six years sounds like a short time, but it was a very intense journey into the very heart of politics in Canada. And I'm curious to know whether you were always interested in a political career. No, that's nowhere part of any family history. Uh, I had uh, no intention or any uh, expectation that I would ever serve in Parliament. However, because of having moved, uh, when we moved to Portage la Prairie, we happened to land in a house next to the sitting member of parliament. So that's one <laughs> incident. And then the, the president of the Conservative Association was across the street and his kids and our kids were the same age. So we got to be quite a friendly group. And when the sitting member of parliament said he wouldn't run again, uh, somebody said, well, why don't you run, Sig? Which we, which Vera and my wife Vera and I just laughed off to begin with, but then strong pressure persuaded us that we should at least stand for nomination, and that's how it started. At the time, I think Parliament was comprised largely, if not completely, of lawyers and businessmen. Perhaps it's fair to say it still is. And here you arrive, neither of those, at age 38. And you were a social worker and a very musical person, a deeply committed Mennonite. And of course, you were probably the only guy there born in Russia. Now, who is more shocked when you found yourself there? You or Parliament? Well, Parliament is interesting. It receives new members every session so that it wasn't unusual for to get some nondescript person showing up on a back bench somehow in an election. So I was just one of several others. So, but uh, I, uh, well, I, we talk about the makeup of Parliament. In, in the Conservative Party, there was only one field member at the time, and uh, Gene Wads. And uh, th that's quite singular. That's quite an, uh, that has changed quite a lot now since then. So, hasn't well, it? what did you say when people kept asking you that question, which is on the record? Oh, what's a guy like you doing in politics? <laughs> well, I, everybody always t is critical of government. Oh, the government should have done that. And why did they do this? Well, why? If you ever have a chance to have a seat in Commons, why don't you want to take it then? And that's that's how it more or less rationalized. Well, quit squawking. If you can do something, go ahead and do it. So that's all. What was your family life like at the time? Your life situation when you took up this political work? Well, that's the hardest part: the family the stress on family, because uh, we have. I had been uh, uh, the executive director of the Children's Aid Society, and we were forever uh, and, and acquiring to establish foster homes where neglected children could experience family life. And in various meetings around the what was f my future constituency, I was talking about uh, foster families trying to include the foster children as part of their family, especially the fathers. They should also be part of that. So when I got elected in 1962, I thought, well, the most parliament sessions go for about four years. We moved our family to Ottawa, a young family to Ottawa. And that was an interesting experience because the session started in September and in February. That's only five months later, the, the prime minister is defeated on a nuclear warhead issue. And so I'm without a job after five months. After electioneering and thinking I'd have four years, I got five months. Well, we moved back to Portage la Prairie. And this is midterm now in February. And first of all, in Ottawa, they were in a 13th grade system. So what is a grade eight boy of Manitoba? Where did he fit in? So, so that was barely adjusted. And, but finally, that worked. And then in February, we say, oh, well, we changed our mind. We're going back to Manitoba, you know. So that's just one of those difficulties. But because I had won with such a good majority in my first election, I was persuaded that surely you're going to run again, and I did in 1963. 
Now, this was the era of some very colorful and iconic political figures. I'm thinking here of Pierre Trudeau, of Lester Pearson, of Diefenbaker, and of course, Tommy Douglas, who I think arrived in Parliament about the same time as you. Do you have any personal memories of that? What was your impression of Trudeau, for example? Well, I, I see Trudeau is the one that defeated me. That's Trudeau mania, that, so I didn't really serve under his term, but uh, I, he, he was there when he was Justice Minister, and I, I, I sat opposite him in, in Parliament, especially talking about the Canada Pension Plan. We had discussions, he and I, and also on the, well, mainly that issue where I got involved. But uh, talking about uh, Parliament, Tommy Douglas got, d didn't get elected in 1962. He was defeated. Can you believe that? Uh, because in Saskatchewan he had already introduced the Medicare plan. And the doctors had uh, threatened to quit. He had scared the mothers that they wouldn't get service. And they had to hire doctors from England. You might remember that too. So he didn't make it in his own riding, in his own, so his own provincial riding. But then uh, some a member from uh, Coquitlam in BC re resigned to give an opening for him to come in on a by-election. And if a member comes in on a by-election, he gets introduced to the House of Commons by the leader of the, the party uh, or a single member, like Stanley Knowles and Bert Herridge from B BC. They, they welcomed him, him to the House, introduced him to the Speaker. And Mr. Pearson, the Prime Minister, said welcoming words to him. And so did Mr. Diefenbaker, the leader of opposition, welcoming him as a new member. And, when, and even Robert Thompson, who was then leader of the Social Credit Party, made some welcoming comments. And then Tommy Douglas stood up to reply. And somebody shouted, stand up, Tommy. Well, he's a short man. He said, Mr. Speaker, I am standing up. In some houses of debate, we are measured from the shoulders up. <laughs> and that's the kind of thing that <laughs> Tommy Douglas would be able to do, you know. He's, I admired him a lot, yes. Yeah. <laughs> now, you also had a chance to observe Mike Pearson up close, and of course, John Diefenbaker. Tell me a little bit about those two men. Hey, well, okay, well, uh, well, maybe this is an illustration. My parents came to visit me on my invitation to Ottawa. And so I thought I must introduce him to Mr. Diefenbaker, he's my party leader, right? And Mr. Diefenbaker sitting behind his desk and makes the appropriate welcoming comments and some exchange back and forth. And um, it talks about me being a, a good member for the House, to, which was satisfactory for my father to hear. And anyway, then we go across the, uh, the uh, past where the Prime Minister resident is on the second floor there. And uh, Mr. Pearson is walking down the stairs to the chamber. And I said, oh, Mr. Pearson, oh, Mr. Prime Minister said, I would like you to meet my parents, my father, you know. And that man puts his arm around my shoulder and he says, such a good member, he's just with the wrong party. So that illustrates the two different individuals. <laughs> I know that you were in Parliament on the day that John F. Kennedy was assassinated. What are your memories of that day in particular? Oh, that was a very difficult day. Um, the House of Commons usually had committee meetings in the morning and didn't start sessions until 10 o'clock in the evening and the afternoon and sat until 10 o'clock at night, you know. So that was generally the weekday. But on Fridays, when members wanted to get home earlier, we had a morning session, and uh, Mr. Pearson starts off, the, uh, the Prime Minister starts off the session by declaring that Air Canada, or no, it was Trans Canada Airlines at that time, had purchased uh, a DC-9 uh, 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 um, jet aircraft for Air Canada. And there had been a competing bid from France, oh yeah, and the, the McConnell Douglas company said that if we get the contract, the Canadian industry will build about 40% of their tail section. That means about four or 5,000 jobs. And the competing airline from France had said the same thing about air, their airplane. So it wasn't so much the plane it, that the Prime Minister had in his mind. It means jobs. So he got persuaded. Well, it, uh, it must have also been a better bid, I guess. So by announcing the choice of aeroplane, he meant there are 5,000 jobs for Toronto. And, but that didn't end there. Then 
<coughs> the Canadian the Test Canada Airline overhaul base, which was at Winnipeg, was going to be moved to Montreal to make up for the fact that they didn't get the job. But meantime, Winnipeg going to, was going to lose the job. And when that, when that happened, Mr. Be Diefenbaker was straight, straight on his feet. He didn't be, want to be recognized by the chair. He was pointing to the prime minister that the, West is, uh, the East is shafting the West again. And, and when, he, when the leaders were doing that, you can imagine the noisy backbenchers doing that. I was ashamed to sit there just back and forth rumbling. I hoped in the valley there was nobody there that would know me, you know. That's the kind of session it was in the morning. And then we adjourned for dinner. And there's a parliamentary restaurant on the sixth floor. It's over the House of Commons. And in that restaurant, if you sit with a table for four or six, you get seated that way. However, if you go alone but don't want to sit alone, the, both the Liberals and the Tories had an oval table for about 16 members, so there would always be somebody there, you know. And once in a while, the chief would sit at that table. And that morning, he sat at that table. And we were reviewing how Pearson got almost apoplectic over his decision to move the overhaul base from Winnipeg to, to, to Montreal. When Diefenbaker's secretary, there was no radio in the restaurant, when Diefenbaker's secretary comes to him, dressed with a message, the president has been shot. And he just left his table and walked out. And uh, John A. McDonald, a liberal, was sitting behind me, what's, what's wrong with the chief? And I said, well, the president had been shot. Well, no, nobody knew what to do with that. We all knew it was Kennedy. He had been to Ottawa a few months earlier, you know. So we had all seen him. and. Uh, then we convened the house at, uh, at one o'clock, I guess, we came back for lunch. And Mr. Pearson gets up to announce the terrible tragedy and wishing Godspeed for an early recovery when a page boy was coming along and hands him a note that the president has died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. Well, Mr. Diefenbaker then got up that at a time like this, there can be no division in this house. The president belongs to the ages and all kinds of phrases you wish you could have thought of yourself. And I'm sitting there saying, wait a minute, two hours ago I was ashamed to be sitting here. Now I'm witnessing a moment of history. That's what I remember about Kennedy's essay. And that's quite a story, isn't it? In those six years that you were there with this oddly unpredictable series of minority governments. What were the issues you tackled? I mean, what was really accomplished in those years? Well, yeah, man, many people have asked about that. Well, there wasn't much done. All, all minority governments, and it's true, they all were minority governments. However, there were over 52 statutes that had been dealt with and passed. And among them were contentious things like, for example, the flag that went on and that caused the longest session of parliament that ever had been held in Canada. We, we had no re summer recess, it was just going on and on. About the flag? Uh, mostly about the flag, yeah. So that, and that, and, and I had to legitimately, and in my speech, I, I, su I supported the old flag because I had received the petitions from some uh, legion, legionnaires and and uh, had no letters at all supporting the idea that we needed a new flag. And uh, Mr. Pearson actually came to Portage la Prairie during this session, during the, during the debates. And there was a large assembly of uh, legionnaires at that time, and he talked about wanting a new flag, and he was booed. He, was, he, he just, it was a very difficult thing for Prime Minister Pearson to do. And finally, I, and now I'm very proud of the flag, but uh, <laughs> Uh, it was uh, protested long and wide, yeah. So, and then, then, then you talked about what other things. Well, uh, the Canada Pension Plan. That is a major legislation that affects the whole country, right? And uh, it only became effective after you have uh, worked for ten, like it was proclaimed in 1966. And you have to have contributed to the pension plan for at least 10 years before you got any benefit. So the person who is 55 and retires at 65, he gets it benefits in five years. But the kid that's starting at age 18, he has to wait 45 years before he gets any benefit from that. So you, they were, they, they were, you couldn't make anything that would fit everybody. But 
uh, that's why it was so hard to get it through. And in addition to that, uh, we dealt with the divorce laws. Up until then, uh, the, the, uh, infidelity was the only le legal reason for divorce. But we were able to get in marriage breakdown and uh, you know these other causes, so that got to be much more uh, civil uh, act, and that that was a major issue too. And in addition to that, uh, uh, the Columbia River Treaty, which Mr. Diefenbaker and uh, President Eisenhower had signed back in the, in the 19 f late 50s, uh, ha had to be renegotiated because BC had not been happy with the with the treaty. Then Mr. Pearson and Mr. Kennedy signed uh, the uh, revised Columbia River Treaty, which takes that river from from B BC all the way to. U.S. It's, that's why it's a major river that needed attention. So that was also a major thing. And in the, the, then, of course, we also uh, got the Order of Canada established. That had never been established before. And my, fa my, my father is a recipient of the Order of Canada, for example. And there, there was also a new labor code. I was amazed to read that this established a minimum wage of a dollar twenty-five. This is in 1964. <laughs> And uh, also that it would mean a 40-hour week with two weeks vacation after one year. That, that was also got into power then, you know. It's amazing how made these things that affected our, our life here in this country, well, these were dealt with in these minority governments. Well, people take this kind of thing for granted, not really understanding the battle and the back and forth that it took. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. It took to achieve them. You know, on that same note, I know that you were able to see the political process, not just the way it was reported in the media or textbooks, but you saw it with your own eyes. You knew how things happened. I'd like you to tell us what you know about the relationship between Canada and what was called Red China at the time. That was a very hot topic. Tell us what you learned about that. Canada, of course, wants to market its wheat, so they're always looking for customers to sell wheat. And uh, there had been some expectation that why not deal with China, that it, would, would, it could use as something. However, there was a lot of reluctance because we would have to deal with a communist country, not just selling wheat, but also getting granting credit to a communist country. So the Diefenbaker, this happened in the Diefenbaker cabinet in 1962. The cabinet struggled with this issue and, and had their cabinet meeting in, in, in Parliament Hill and also 24 Sussex because it had to be reviewed. Diefenbaker was so unsure about it. Finally, they agreed, okay, Alvin Hamilton, the Minister of Agriculture, will go to China, make a deal. And so Alvin Hamilton takes off and goes to China, but on the way he has to change pla planes in Vancouver. Well, at the airport, uh, uh, the uh, the um, uh, Roger Ferguson gets a call to stop. Uh, tell the minister that it's off. We, sh we shouldn't go. And uh, Mr. Hamilton, the minister, uh, was uh, scheduled to go. He said, "Let's just say we didn't get that call." And he goes and makes the deal. And after it was successfully applauded by the rest of the country, then Diefenbaker took full credit for having sold me to China. So. But uh, I understand the leader's situation because there was a lot of uh, broad spread reluctance about dealing with a communist country, you know, so, uh, yeah. So after six years and participating in all those very significant issues and feeling like a bit of a stranger a lot of the time, I'm sure, you personally were narrowly defeated. I'm wondering how that felt. Well, I may, you mentioned my age, and that means we have a young family. We have four, four children. Our daughter, Kathy, she's still a, pre, a preschooler. And the others were in a 13 grade system in Ontario. And uh, when I got defeated after only five months, we came back to the Manitoba system. And then after in the 63 election, uh, my wife Vera decided, well, we'll just stay in Portage la Prairie, and then I would go uh, to Ottawa, come back on weekend, you see. And then ha having had 
and that, that was my fourth election, right? We were mainstreeting Nipawa and McGregor and uh, Crickfield Park. And our party started, or the constituency started just west of Grace Hospital here in Winnipeg. So I had quite an urban area in my writing. And, 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 and the stress of family life, we were pleased to be defeated. That was better than resigning because now the constituency, and it was a very, very narrow vote. It was almost the equivalent of one vote per poll. David Orlico, my NDP colleague, told me this, that that's, uh, that's how narrow the defeat was. But I'm very, I'm very glad to have had the parliamentary experience because, as you already indicated, having born in post-revolutionary Russia, starting in, in a very difficult uh, immigrant family on, on the farm here in Manitoba, to that child being able to claim a seat in the Canadian House of Commons satisfied my sense of history very much. <laughs>